If you're wondering who I go to when I'm broken And if you're wondering who I talk to when I'm sad And if you're wondering how do I carry on through all the heartache that I've been through Oh my friend, let me tell you Jesus, He can wash away each stain, He comforts like no other can, and He always has a plan. I go to Jesus. Now we all have our fortunes and our upsets. And We've all been down the road of deep regret But as for me, there's always one friend Who I know that I can go to In each trial that I go through I go to Jesus For only He can heal my pain I go to Jesus us, for he can wash away each stain, he comforts like no other can, and he always has a plan, I go to Jesus, I go to Jesus. Got the guys standing by to turn off the lights in the building. I'm going to have it as dark as I can in here. So if you're with a child that's scared of the dark, afraid of the dark, uh, you might want to kind of just maybe hold him. If you need to step outside in the light there, I'm just going to keep it off for about 30 or 45 seconds. It won't be that long. Um, I just want to illustrate something tonight. So uh, don't be fearful about it. But um, just if you have kids that are afraid of that, just... Uh, Probably the only thing you will see is the exit lights and um, the light that's in the back there. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. Are you there? Say amen. amen. The Bible says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. <clears throat> For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Verse number 8 is our text verse tonight. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I want to talk to you tonight about children of light need to walk in the light. Children of light need to walk in the light in the light. Now, I'm going to turn off the lights here just for about 45 seconds to a minute or somewhere like that. I think he's got it up there, Javier. You're good. Thank you for helping. But uh, let me just do that right now and just uh, don't move. All right, but let's go ahead and do that. Turn off those lights. It's not going to get real dark in here, but it'll get dark enough. Just if you could be quiet just for a minute, just... Now, I've got a lighter here that I'm going to strike, and I want you to notice how much light just comes in a, from the dark room just from a single lighter striker here. You ready for this? 
See how much light that gives off? Just one little light. You turn it back off and it kind of gets dark again. All right, fellas, you can turn back on the light. Let me ask you a couple questions and try to be honest with me. How many of you were a little, if I wouldn't even have told you, if, that, if the lights just would have went out, how many of you would have been a little fearful, a little anxious, maybe a little uneasy? And, um, and that's the way it is when we're in the dark, unless we're sleeping, of course, and then it's good. But if you were to begin to get up and walk around, and your eyes hadn't adjusted yet. I know your eyes began to adjust to the light, and it got a little brighter as God has given us uh, that capability to adjust to the light that's in the room. But my point is this. We're talking about darkness, and darkness is not really the opposite of light. Darkness is the absence of, absence of light. Um, men were in darkness. The world was in darkness. And then God said, let there be light. Salvation, they were, men were dark, and God is the light. And they came to the light. And, of course, the light comprehended it not. Um, uh, the, if we were to right away tell you to walk around and turn off the lights and it was that dark and it was completely dark, we were to get rid of all the light in this room. And I were to tell you to get up from your seat and start walking this way, you'd probably bump into one another. Uh, you'd probably stumble over something because that's what darkness does. And so tonight, I want to just use that illustration, and here's my point. It's very natural to feel insecure and fearful when you cannot see where you're going. It's natural to feel uncomfortable and uneasy when it's dark and you cannot see. It would be very probable to slip and stumble or bump into something if you and I are in the dark and we cannot see what is around us. And Paul says here in our text that this is the way it used to be when we were in the dark, when we were lost. Look again at verse number 8, if you will. I'm going to grab a southern mic now, brother. Ready? In verse number 8 here, it says, For ye, and the key word there, praise the Lord tonight, if you are a born-again child of God, this is the key word in the whole verse. It says, ye were, past tense, amen? Ye were sometimes darkness. But, and here's the other key word, now, <laughs> Amen. Ye were darkness and darkness. Now are ye light in the Lord. And then the challenge is this, and this is my challenge tonight for us as well. If we are the light in the Lord and we were sometimes in darkness, then the command and the challenge, if you will, here is right after the colon where Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says then, walk as children of the light. So we are light. We have the light in us. But we can't have times where we walk in darkness. Not salvation here. I'm talking about more like a life. Living a life in darkness because it goes on to say later on that the deeds were evil. And so it only exposes that. So I want to talk to you tonight again about this challenge and, and let us follow God as dear children. Look at verse number 1. Have I prayed yet? No? Let's pray. Father, bless the service, I pray. Please use this in a mighty way. Use me. Please help me tonight. Hide me behind your cross so you may be seen. I pray, Lord, that we would um, get a better understanding of what it means to be uh, who we are, who we represent, and what we're commanded to do is to walk as God's dear children in, in his light and as light. And so, Father, be with us tonight. It's, it's a real short message. It's not very long. But uh, please challenge our hearts and, and strengthen our body, uh, this, this church body, Lord. May we um, be uh, glorifying you tonight in all that we do. We sure do love you. Thank you for just being who you are. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to look at chapter 5 and get this whole concept of walking in the light in context. Um, it says here in chapter 5, verse number 1, Be ye therefore followers of God. So if we're going to follow God, the word there literally means to imitate. It means to imitate God. Be ye therefore imitators of God, if you could say. Man, that's, that's something that's a challenge to me, is to imitate God. And he says, why? Because you're his dear, dear children. As dear children, let us. And then verse number two, 
We see three walks here in chapter 5 alone that we are to be imitators in. Number one is, look at chapter two, chapter 5, verse number 2. The Bible says, and walk in. So the very first thing that we are to be imitators, listen to me, is how we are to walk in love. And God is love, right? And you cannot love unless you are in God, unless you are in Christ. And we can say we love someone, but if you're not saved, you can't love because you don't know what love is. But we who are children of God need to follow God and follow his love and imitate his love. You know, it's been said that imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And it really is. I know when I was a little boy, I, I would imitate, and any child does. They would imitate, a, a son would imitate their father. Right? A father would teach them and take them outside and, 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 and throw a football with them. And pretty soon... He wants to be just like his dad and throw that football just like he does. Because that's just what he desires to do. Are you with me? The little girl desires to follow her mom into uh, the uh, place where she puts on her makeup. And she begins maybe to start practicing fake, you know, with fake makeup while she's little and doing what mom, sitting right next to her doing what mom does. And why? Because she wants to imitate the one she loves. Are you with me? And so Paul says here, as dear children, like a child would imitate their parent. Um, I remember, um, uh, I, you know, I was a, a big fan of my dad, amen, and I uh, loved my dad, and my dad's in heaven. I still love my dad, but I can't tell him that anymore. Dad, I love you. Uh, there you go, the great cloud of witnesses. He heard me. But I would follow my dad to the end of the world, man, when I was little. I mean, whatever my dad did. So I remember one time my dad, my dad's a jokester. You never got to meet my dad, and I'm sorry that you never did. Well, maybe you're glad you never did. No. <laughs> my dad was a big jokester, okay? I mean, he was a clown, okay? And he just loved to do practical jokes. Well, when I was little, he would take me to the store, and uh, this is where I get my, if you wonder, Marcy, where I get my smelling everything. She goes, you smell everything. And uh, why do you have to smell everything? Some things I don't want to smell, amen? I'm sorry that I did. But um, anyway, I'm like a hound dog, I guess. I just got to smell something. But anyway, so my dad's going through the store, and he knows that, that I'm, I'm going to imitate him because this is what a child does who loves their dad. So he's going through the store, and he's, he's sniffing things. And, of course, he comes to the things that smell good, all right? And I forgot all the things. I mean, I was real little. But he was telling me this story later on, you know, and he still laughs about it. And... Um, but uh, smelling these things, uh, anyway, he gets over to the cheese, uh, yeah, and he picks up the cheese, and he picks up the cheddar, and he smells it, he goes, oh, son, smell this, and I'm, this is when you used to have it open, you could just grab it, you know, and, and buy what you want, you know, cut off what you want or whatever, it wasn't packaged up, and he said, smell this, and I'd smell this, and I'd smell, and I'd go through all the cheeses, and I'd, oh, dad, this is great, you're such a great dad, and then he'd give me this cheese, Many of you know, it's called Limburger. And, man, he would take it, and he would kind of cup his hand. You know how dads like to trick you, and he'd go, oh, he wouldn't smell it, you know. He'd be like, oh, this is my favorite, son. This is my favorite. And so I would take that Limburger cheese, and I'd be so happy. I'd look at my dad. He liked it. I'm going to imitate him. And I'd stick that thing in my nose, man, and I'd rub it in my nose and smell it and <laughs> and I thought, my dad is a liar, <laughs> a deceiver. And uh, there were other things that I wanted to imitate uh, my dad. We went to the barber shop one time, and uh, my dad would get up in the chair, and he'd get a haircut, and then he'd say, give him what I got. And at at at, when I was young, I didn't know the difference, and so my little mind's working. How many, how many men, I don't know if they call them today because the barbershops are very hardly existent, but um, all these beauty parlors now, right? But uh, we used to go to a barbershop and ask for a medium. How many of you No. You asked for a medium? No? Well, that's what my dad always got. My dad got a medium cut, and uh, I guess, you know, in my little mind, I'm thinking, Restaurant, you know, uh, fast food, small, medium, large, right? 
So I wanted to go in there, and I'm just this big kid now, you know, and I, I guess I just must have turned 10. So, so I, was, I was this big, you know, minded. I got this mind, and I'm going, Barber, today I don't want a medium. I'm going to go all out. I want a large. <laughs> and there wasn't a large. There wasn't a small either. Was just a, there was a medium, a medium haircut, and that was what it was called back then when I was getting a haircut. But what, what was the purpose? I wanted to be like my dad. My dad loved football. Oh, my dad loved football. He started me at a young age in the backyard throwing a football. I could throw a football when I was probably three, seriously. Uh, I was playing on a football team when I was five and uh, played all the way through, all the way through high school, and, and, uh, and I loved football. I loved the game. I loved the sport. And, um, and so why? Because I want to imitate what my dad. Anyway, you get the point. And my point is tonight is as a, as a father, a heavenly father, as his dear children, he wants us to imitate him. And one of the things he wants us to imitate him is our walk. Uh, that walk means your manner of life. It's, it's how you live. It's, it's, where, it's where you arrive to, not just the physical walk. It's, it's how you present yourself. And as we're imitating our heavenly father because we love him and we want to be like him, we are want to please him. We want to please him in our walk of love. Now, what is this walk of love? Look at verse number three. Well, let's continue verse number two. So be followers of God as dear children. Be imitating God and walk in love as Christ hath also loved us. How did Christ love us? He hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so the walk of love here, the walk in love as Christ loved us, is a giving of himself kind of love, a sacrificial kind of love. And when we imitate the love of Christ, we give ourselves and we sacrifice ourselves. And to that end, God is well pleased and it's a good smell. Isn't that what it says? A sweet smelling savor. How many of you like to grill out? Man, I love to grill out. One of the, one of the greatest, yes, one of the greatest things about grilling out to me is when you first put those, whatever you're cooking, on that hot grill, and you get that and you shut the lid and let it sear real good, and then you go, oh, I can't wait to sink my teeth into whatever it is I'm cooking, amen, because <laughs> it smells really good. And that's the way when we walk in love and we imitate God, that's the way God's, it's, it's a sweet smell. I want to please God like that. I want to imitate my heavenly father like that. So how do we imitate Christ's love? Well, there's many ways, but look at verse number three. One way is that we don't give ourselves over to these things. What's that, pastor? Look at verse number three. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, okay, these are things that will not please God. These are things that you are not imitating your heavenly father. You're imitating where you once were in darkness. Are you with me? And by the way, the whole principle here is not just the absence of light of salvation. The whole point is God's people can walk in darkness. Okay? Not, uh, they, uh, saved people can walk in darkness. Okay? They can be saved and make a choice to do these things. But these things don't imitate God. They imitate the devil they imitate the world and it says in verse number three fornication uncleanness covetousness not only to walk in that but he says let it not be once named among you as because that's not what becomes us because why we're trying to please our father we're trying to bring a sweet smell to his nostrils we're trying to make a life a walk that is pleasing to him and those things beloved are not walking in love those are walking in lust and so look at verse number four. He continues the list of things that do not please and things do not. He says, neither. In other words, not just this list, but neither filthiness. How about this one? Foolish talking. Isn't some of the talk that we do just foolish? It ends up into much foolishness, and, and then it ends up into sin. 
Careful what you say. Nor jesting. It means, you know, joking around in a bad way. Um, are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Why don't you replace all those things with just thanking God for, for what he's done. Verse number five. For this ye know. That no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom, any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of these disobedience. Be not ye therefore. Why? Because it's not a sweet smell. Why? Because it doesn't imitate the one that I want to imitate. It doesn't, it doesn't match up to the one I'm trying to follow. Are you with me? I told you it's going to kind of, kind of tie into what we talked about a little bit this morning. So how do we imitate our love that Christ gave us? Well, we don't follow these things. But look at verse number 4. I'm sorry, not for verse number 4. Look at verse number 9. For the fruit of the Spirit... So when we're walking in the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit will be evident, right? Remember the apple and the orange? They'll be seen. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all. That's a better list than what we just read. Amen. And. And. So those are the things, listen to me, that imitate our Father. He's all good. He's all righteous. And he's all truth. <laughs> that is what we're supposed to be walking like as we imitate him in our walk of love. But there is a second walk here tonight. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says here, see then that you walk, what church? Circumspectly. That's a big word, isn't it? Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So verse number two tells us to walk in love and tells us the things that do not contain love, but rather lust, fornication, covetousness, uncleanness, filthiness, foolish talking. Let not these be named once among us, because that's not imitating God. But there's another walk that we walk circumspectly. Now, what does circumspectly mean? Circumspectly here, it means, um, I wrote it down. Here it is. It means to walk perfectly. Uh oh, that just disqualifies every one of us. No, perfectly means maturely. Let me, let me, let me help you here. It also means diligent, it also means exact. Jesus knew where he was going, had a place to go. And he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he didn't let anything stop him from doing what God wanted him to do. Now, remember, he was tempted in all points as yet without sin, right? So he had every temptation you and I had. Yet he didn't fall prey to it because he was walking, listen to me, circumspectly. Okay? Now, listen to me. Walking circumspectly means being a mature, listen to me, a mature Christian. If you have been saved... For more than a year or two, I understand new Christians are still, the Bible says they're still, you know, drinking milk. But there comes a time, listen to me, where it's time to put away the milk and grab meat. Amen? I remember my girls were first introduced to meat. Oh, I don't remember when it was, but I remember there was a time where they were wondering what in the world are you eating on your plate, and I got this milk, right? They, they, you just see them looking, going, huh? And you're like, no, not yet. <laughs> but there came a time where maybe there were a couple teeth in there, and you're like, okay, I think this time, and you chopped it up. I mean, you chopped it up so fine it looked like it was gross looking. <laughs> well, it used to look like a good-looking piece of steak. Now it looked like whatever. And, um, but we cut it all up to make sure they wouldn't what? Choke on it. But, but here's the problem. Some of us need to move from the milk of the word to the meat and mature and grow up and put away the darkness in your life because it will cause you to stumble. It will cause you to be fearful, 
to follow God all the way to what God wants you to do. He wants you to walk in love. He wants you to walk circumspectly. Look at verse number 16. Redeeming the time because the days are, isn't that so true? Buying up every opportunity. Why? Because we live in evil days. Buying up the opportunities that come our way to serve God and to please him in our walk. So we walk in love. We walk. Look at verse number 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. A lot of us don't even know what the will of the Lord is because we are not walking circumspectly. Jesus set the example. He kept eternity in view. He walked circumspectly. He was perfectly mature. And he wanted to please his father because that's, that's who he was trying to imitate. Amen? Verse number 18 talks about, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Wasn't Jesus just filled with the Spirit? You say, well, he, he, he was Jesus. Yeah, but he was also man. The Son of Man as well as the Son of God. Verse number 20, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. Giving thanks. Well, that's something that's missed out today. But someone that's walking circumspectly, look, look at me. Let me help you here tonight. Everybody say this with me. Ready? Let's see if you can do it. Thank you. Say it. Say it again. Say it again. Now, when's the last time you said that for the blessings that God gave you? When's the last time you said that to your Sunday school teacher who teaches you the Bible every day or every Sunday? When's the last time you said that, wife, to your husband? Well, nothing. Be, well, there's your problem. My Bible says giving thanks always. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Well, you don't know who I live with. You married him. So start learning to give thanks. Amen. You made that decision. Instead of bickering about it, instead of lead, leading into divorce court, why don't you get right with the Lord and give thanks for that person and maybe God will turn that marriage around. Amen. I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just trying to be real here. We, we are not following God in these things. We're not walking circumspectly in that. Therefore, we end our lives back in darkness, back to where we once were. And we're wondering, we're stumbling around going, what's going on? What happened? What happened is you didn't know you didn't walk in love. We didn't walk circumspectly. And then the final thing tonight that I want to really talk about as, I, as we discussed here, as we turned out the lights and we were in darkness for a little while, is that we are to walk as children of light. So walk in love, that's a walk that pleases God. That's a walk that imitates the Father. Walk circumspectly, that's a walk that pleases God, that imitates the Father. And then walk as children of light. Why? Because he is light. Look at verse number 8 again. For ye were. I love that word were because that's not what I am anymore. I, I'm not what I should be, but by the grace of God, I'm not what I used to be. But ye were sometimes darkness. That's where I was. When the Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down. I was lost and undone without God and his son. That's where I was. And sometimes I find myself... Going back there. Paul said this, and if you don't think a Christian can walk in darkness, then the greatest Christian I believe in the New Testament that ever walked was the Apostle Paul. And he said, you know, when I do good, you know what I find? Evil's present with me. <laughs> what in the world's going on here? People say, I have to try to go to church. I, I, I read my Bible. I've got the Bible reading schedule. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, and I'm trying to walk in light. And then sometimes we stumble. That's called the humanity. So don't beat yourself up tonight, but here, don't stay that way. Because not only that's where you were, once were for salvation, if you stay there, then you'll never grow into sanctification. You'll never have a sanctified life, victory in the Christian life. You'll always be stumbling around in the dark, trying to adjust to see where things are, where God says, but it's so better just to walk in the light. Verse number 9, again, you will know that children of light are, have the fruit of the Spirit and there will be goodness and righteousness and truth. That doesn't mean they'll be perfect. It just means this is what they're trying to do to please their Father. 
And they, they've made some good choices. Look at verse 10. They'll be proven what is acceptable unto the Lord. Let me help you young people out here. You're trying to make a decision about what's acceptable. Can I just tell you this? Just make sure whatever you do is acceptable unto the Lord. And everything else will fall in place. Amen? It's like that little kid, George Truett's uh, granddaughter, who said, I finished the puzzle. No, you no way you finished. Yes, I did. How'd you finish? Well, I put the man together, and the world took care of itself. You know, if you put yourself together, you won't have to worry about anybody else, and you won't have to worry about your relationship. If your vertical re- uh, relationship is right, your horizontal relationship will be right. Your vertical with God is right. Your horizontal with man will be right. How many even know that's true? You, you cannot, you cannot prove me now and try to be wrong with God or right with God and still be wrong with your, with your spouse, with your fellow man. You can't. Jesus was in favor with God and man. And we can be too, but you got to make sure that your relationship here is right and that you're doing things that please him, proving that which is acceptable unto him. Verse number 11, and have some fellowship. Because you want to win them to the Lord, because you, so you got to be like them. I got to act like them, dress like them, because I'll fit in, and then I can tell them of my faith. That's not what it says. It says, "Have no fellowship." That that means zero. That means none, nil, nothing. <laughs> no fellowship with the unfruitful works of, but rather reprove them. So just like that lighter, the presence of light that, ex- that gave us a little hope, right? To imitate God in our walk tonight, let us be like that light. Now, I've got two things here by way of points. Here they are. Number one, long introduction, short message. Let us walk in the light, if you're taking notes, and we'll do that by exhibiting light. Amen? We walk in the light by showing others his light. Look at Matthew chapter 5. I told you we were going to turn here this morning. Matthew chapter 5, very familiar passage here. I love this verse, and I quote it a lot because it reminds me of what I need to be doing and who the glory belongs to. Those are the two things I get out of these verses, what I need to be doing and who the glory belongs to. You're going to see that. Look at chapter 5. Look at verse number 14. Ye are the light of the world. Who's he talking to here? Us, right? Christians, right? Ye are the light of the world. Okay? This is us. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. See that? And it giveth light unto all, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine. Not this way. That's darkness. But this way. <laughs> Let your light so shine before, read it with me, before men that they may see your light, your good works. And then what happens? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. So two things happen when we try to please God with our walk and our walking in light. We are remembering what we need to be doing and remembering who gets all the glory. Are you with me? So let us be walking in the light, exhibiting Light. That's my first point. On the coast of Norway is a lighthouse where the keeper lived with his two children. One day he went to the distant shore for provisions. A storm arose and he was unable to return. The time for lighting the lamp came and Mary, the elder child, said unto her little brother, We must light the lamp, Willie. How can we, asked Willie. We, we ain't big enough. But the two children climbed the long, narrow stairs to the tower where the lamp was kept. Mary pulled up a chair and tried to reach the lamp in the uh, great reflector, but it was too high. 
Groping down the stairs, she ascended again with a small oil lamp in her hand. I can hold this up, she said to her little brother. She climbed on the chair again, but still the reflector was just beyond her reach. Get down, said Willie. I know what we can do. She jumped down and stretched his little body across the chair. Stand on me, he said. And she stood on the little fellow as he lay across the chair. She raised the lamp high, and its light shone far out across the water. Holding it first with one hand and then the other to rest her little arm, she called down her brother. She called down to her brother, does it hurt, Willie? Of course it hurts, he called back. But keep the light burning. Don't let it go out. You see, he was hurting. It was tough. But he was more interested, or should I say, more desirous that that light doesn't go out. My point is this. Life smacks you in the face, doesn't it? Life happens. And it's not always easy. I wish it, I wish it were. Living the Christian life definitely isn't easy. It's going to have some turmoil. It's going to have some hardships. It's going to have some trials. Many of you have gone through those. But you know what? He still wants our life to shine. He never wants us to put it under a bushel. He wants us to shine our light. A little a church at church, little Jane had listened to a sermon on let your light shine. The only part she remembered was the text, but she didn't understand what it meant until her mother explained. It means being good, obedient, and, and a servant. In the afternoon, there was trouble in the nursery. And Jane silently excused herself for being naughty by saying, I'm sorry, I've done blowed myself out. <laughs> nursery workers, can you, can you identify? <laughs> Number two, and finally tonight, Walking in light exhibits light. That's how we imitate God. And then lastly, walking in light, can I say this? Exposes the darkness. It exposes the darkness. Again, absence of light. Darkness is not opposite of light. It is absence of light. Turn to John chapter 3, and we'll close with this. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is an interesting chapter, of course, we understand um, for many verses here talking about Nicodemus coming to Christ for salvation and, and a wonderful verse there in verse 16, right? The one that we know and love and one we use out soul winning. But I want you to look at verse number 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let me stop and ask a question. Men didn't come to the light for salvation because their deeds were evil. But when men did come to the light, they still chose to walk a path that led them back into darkness. Not back into getting have to get saved again, but back into a life of struggling with sin. Are you with me? If you don't believe that, then you don't understand your Bible. But we've got to understand that salvation doesn't stop you from sinning. You got that, right? I often say this. Salvation gives us the clear answer and to the answer of the question, where are you going when you die? But salvation does not cover the consequences for your sin. Only the consequence that you're going to go to heaven now instead of hell. But we still got to pay for those consequences. Okay? If we can understand that. So... For everyone, now notice this, for everyone, that means saved and lost, everyone that doeth evil, so these people that want to continually work to do evil and live a life that's not pleasing to God, they could be saved, but they have chosen evil. Are you with me? They've chosen to hurt and be malicious. They've chosen, listen, not to forgive people. They've chosen to be resentful and bitter. They've chosen a life that, uh, because they can't get over their anger because somebody did them wrong. Are you with me? These are the kind of people, listen to me, that we're talking about. Everyone that doeth this, what's the next three words? Hate the light. I hate to use this illustration because it's pretty nasty. Because I hate roaches with a passion, amen? 
I'd rather jump into a, a pool with a crocodile than a, than a pool of cockroaches. And I mean that with every bit of my being. Chances are I could get away from that crocodile, but I'm going to get all, all over those cockroaches. <laughs> but, you know, some of us, listen to me, seriously, some of us live our lives, listen to me, like we used to, that you've been delivered from. And we're like a cockroach Christian. You ever been into a house that's infested with cockroaches? When you turn off the light, man, they are just everywhere. Why? Because their deeds are evil. Their deeds are evil. Amen. And their deeds are evil too. <laughs> Nasty creatures. I don't know. I got to ask God when I get there. Why do you ever create snakes and cockroaches? I don't know. I don't even like spiders either. Spiders scare me. Especially the ones that jump at you. Amen. Get away from me, man. Somebody kill that thing. But I'm just saying. So you turn on the light, what's the first thing a cockroach does? Finds a dark spot, right? Can I say that's the way sometimes the Bible is in our lives when we're walking in darkness? The preacher turns on a light, a scripture, and you know that you're in darkness. You know that you need to get right. You know that your walk is not pleasing. You know that it, right now your life stinks to God. Come on. You can't forgive. Listen to me. You can't get over your hurt. You can't get past whatever. You can't get that. You you can't get control of your passions. God says, when the light turns on, you scurry. You hate the evil. Or you hate the light. Look at verse 20. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. They don't want to come to the light either. Why? Lest his deeds, whatever he's doing, should be exposed. Reproved, right? Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone that doeth evil. Paul said, I, as I do good, evil is present with me. So this includes not just the lost. This includes those who are saved, who have chosen. Listen to me. Who have chosen to continue to walk on in darkness. Sometimes I scratch my head as a pastor and I'm thinking, they said they're saved. Sometimes I scratch my head and tell myself, I thought I was saved. Why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why am I treating that person that way? I'll tell you why. Because you're only exposing who you're walking with. Are you with me? You're only exposing your dark life and that you're stumbling at everything. And when the light switch comes on, you don't want to run to the light. You don't want to come and get right. What do you want to do? You want to run and hide. Instead of saying, I need to let God work in my life. Look at verse number 21, and I'll close. But he that doeth truth. Remember that list of truth, goodness, and righteousness? He that doeth truth, he comes to the light. I'm not saying he that is perfect. Okay, nobody in here lives a perfectly truthful life. But he that doeth truth, he that wants to do truth, he that has a habit of going to the truth and wanting to truth and Having that truth set you free, as John says. He comes to the light. Notice this part. That his deeds may also be manifest. And what are they? That they are wrought in God. Amen? It's that fruit thing. It's that I know this is a banana because I can see it. I know that this person is trying their best to walk in light. Why? Because they're walking in truth. They're coming to the light. They're not hiding Listen to me. They're not, let, let me get practical. They're not missing church over it. They're not not reading their Bible because of it. They're not not walking with the Lord in their private life because of it. Why? Because it's God working in their life, and so that kind of fruit is exposed. His deeds shall be either reproved or found out that this is the Lord working. This is the Lord working. Let us make sure tonight, let's go back to our text here. Ephesians, let's just read it one last time. Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, 
Oh, how easy it is for us to just get off course, is it not? But how, how much easier it is. Listen to me. There's a lot of scriptures here that I could have given tonight about the light. I think there was 98 verses walking in the light. I, just, I couldn't give all to you, but I just kind of give you a synopsis here. It's easier to stay on track in the light than it is in the dark. That was my whole point of shutting the lights off. If we were to get up immediately before our eyes adjusted to the green exit lights, before it got a little bright in here so we could see, we would have stumbled. We would have fell. And that's what we do in our spiritual life because we're walking in darkness. And it's exposed either as reproving where God's saying, you know you need to get right, or you're walking in truth and therefore it is exposed as being rod in God. Let us make sure tonight that we're imitating God. Look at chapter 5, verse number 1. Read it with me, verse number 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Look at verse number 8. Read it with me. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Can we just determine that from this point on tonight that we're going to make an honest effort to stop walking in darkness? but rather reprove those things? I, I see people in their lives stumbling into, these, into sin. And you know, my hands are tied. I can't just go to that every single person that, and just, you know, tell them how much I love them and this hurts me. A lot of that, they're going to have to be exposed on their own. And you know, when God exposes it, it's, it's very, it's, it's better to come to the light than it is for God to expose your darkness. It's better to humble yourself, listen to me, than to let God do it. Because eventually he will. You can't run in the dark too long as a child of God that walks in the light. You can't do that before something's going to happen. Amen? You can see a lot clearer in the day, so just walk that way, and you won't stumble as easy into those things that we stumble into. Let's ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the truth. I know that it was kind of sobering. It was kind of serious. I didn't really have too many jokes tonight. I I didn't purpose that, but Father, my heart is heavy tonight over sin and, and just over children of God who refused to walk in light, made a choice to stay angry, made a choice to remain bitter, made a choice to not get right with their fellow brethren and sister, made a choice to live in sin. Father, please, I pray that you would help us tonight. I pray as a church body that we would exhibit light, that this community would See our light shine and we can look and say, (laughs) it's all about him. Our theme, glorify you in all that we do. Lord, may we do that with our light. May we do that with our love. May we do that with the way we walk. May we be that kind of church, be that kind of Christian. If there's anybody here tonight, Lord, that's not saved, I pray, Lord, that tonight would be the night of their salvation. They're not sure they're 100% on their way to heaven, Lord, that tonight would be the night that they come forward and say, I need salvation, I'm not saved. May that be tonight. Bless this invitation now, I pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. The music will play. The altar's open. Please use the altar tonight.